how you remember. Okay, I see that the clock says 1900 hours, so that would be time to start. All righty, uh, so let me share my screen with you guys. Oops, that's not how you do it. Don't pray. I am. As soon as I share my screen, I shall. There we go. Now you should see my first slide, yes? Okay, good. <clears throat> so let's pray then, let's dive right in. Father God, we thank you for this gathering of your people, this chance to dive in and study and dissect your word and chew on it a little bit. And we thank you also for the time of fellowship that we'll have as we grow closer to each other, learning, um, learning your word, God, and just uh, um, being able to be in an atmosphere of, fellowship and understanding god so bless the word and bless the ears that it falls upon as well god we give you thanks praise and honor in jesus name so here we are um make sure everything's working correctly here so we're uh, diving into acts chapter two that's where all the excitement happens of course so first um here's a little um review slash overview so last week we covered chapter one and some of the high points of what happened is uh this first we saw <coughs> excuse me the um the uh resurrected jesus meeting with his apostles disciples and um he said to them he instructed them to stay in jerusalem um, and that you, they would receive the Holy Spirit not very long um, after. So, of course, uh, that's what we'll talk about today. We also saw in chapter one, they had the upper room meeting, and uh, we saw that they felt the need to replace Judas, of course, who had died. So they felt the need to replace Judas with the 12th apostle, and of course, they chose Matthias. And um, so we'll pick it up from there, and uh, we'll see that that just keeping in mind that the book of Acts is basically a narrative of uh, what happened in the early church. So we want to pick it up from there. Um, oh, also, I just made a note, just kind of keep in the back of your head for the uh, upper room meeting, the, uh, the scripture tells us that there were about 120 people there. Okay, so diving ahead. So um, starting with uh, verse one in chapter two, it talks about when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. So that's verse one in chapter two. So a couple of things about Pentecost. First of all, um, at some point, it was also known as the Feast of Weeks. And um, it was one of the three great uh, Jewish feasts or festivals, if you want to call it that. Um, also, the I guess because of the uh, the name Penta, uh, maybe you can derive some information from that. But it occurred the, in the seventh week after the Passover. So essentially, the 50th day after whenever Passover was would be the normal Feast of Weeks, the, the Pentecost. And um, it was meant to celebrate, um, actually to celebrate harvest um, and wheat harvest in particular, wheat was a, a major crop in that area. So it was actually meant as a celebration We the to, um, to say, hey God, you've been good to us. You've brought in uh, a, abundant bounty for us and we appreciate that. So, uh, because of this 50-day thing that I just mentioned, uh, keep in mind that the scripture told us that, um, I think that was in the previous chapter, um, it told us that Jesus, after his resurrection, was seen um, by various and sundry people for about 40 days. So 
this is happening, the, the Pentecost would be about 10 days after Jesus had ascended, after he talked to his disciples and said, remain in Jerusalem, you'll receive that power uh, from on high. One other little note here I, I could mention is that just Jewish tradition also associated Pentecost with the idea of covenant renewal, which I think is kind of interesting. So in a way, you can think of this whole event as a as a, a different kind of a covenant, because we've certainly changed gears here with the gift of the Holy Spirit. And of course, the veil and the temple being torn and giving you access, direct access to uh, to God. So all of those things are going on. Now, in verse one, it also says they were in one accord in one place. Um, and I, I thought that was kind of significant too, because remember last week we mentioned this a little bit, that not so long ago, these were the guys that were arguing among themselves about who was the greatest and uh, you know who was going to do what. And remember the the two brothers, they got their mom to come to Jesus and and say, hey, uh, uh, can you have make sure my sons are going to be sitting at your right hand and your left? So they had all of those ambitions going on, but somehow they've they've set that aside and it says they were all with one accord in one place. So then jumping to verse two, it says, um, suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. So um, maybe it's just splitting hairs, but notice it, it doesn't actually say there was wind, but it says there was a sound of wind there. So you get this loud sound, probably, this rushing mighty wind. And um, also, I think the, the idea of wind is symbolic. Uh, we see that throughout the Bible that wind is often symbolic of the Spirit of God itself. So uh, we, we see that uh, a lot of places. One of the places I, I noted was, you all know the story of Ezekiel and the, the Valley of the Dry Bones, right? Mm -hmm. And so in there, it talks about a wind also coming and in the process of, um, of reviving those dead bones, those dry bones. So we see the wind there. Also, uh, another scripture that we'll look at in a bit is in the Gospel of John, and um, let's see, did I put this on here? Maybe I didn't. Um, in the Gospel of John, chapter 20 and verse 22, this is where um, Jesus is talking to his disciples, and he says to the, it says that he breathed on them and said, receive the Spirit. And I think we also see, if I just look at this um, the rushing mighty wind, um, the the definition, like if you look at your strong concordance for that, it also does say wind and breath, both breath of life. So clearly that's uh, representative of the spirit already. So then verse three, we get to the idea of the, the tongues of fire. And it says, there appeared to them divided tongues of fire, and each one sat upon them, which is kind of what this picture you're looking at is depicting here. So, of course, um, these tongues of fire settled on each person, and it says in verse 4 that they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, um, one thing I found kind of interesting is one of the commentaries mentioned the idea that the fire that that came down at, at, on the day of Pentecost was kind of um, reminiscent of uh, the pillar of fire that the children of Israel followed at nighttime in the desert as well. So you've got that whole idea of fire still being here as well. Um And, um, of course, the scripture tells us in verse four also that they uh, they spoke in tongues. And we see um, in just a second, we see that those are actually earthly languages and as the spirit gave them utterance. So earthly languages. And the other thing I thought was interesting is here I, I made the reference to Mark 16, 17. And 
um, this is Jesus prophesying at this point. In, in Mark 16, 17, Jesus says, and these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons and they will speak with new tongues. So here is Jesus's prophecy coming to, uh, to fruition. Now, um, something I, uh, that I, I guess I'll bring this up. Uh, Sharon and I have kind of gone back and forth on this a little bit, but I um, just, if you guys have thoughts about this as we're going through the, the lesson, please feel free to, to uh, type them in. Um, and that would be the, uh, the location of the, the Pentecost event. Um, you know, we, uh, we most commonly think of, well, they were in the upper room in the previous chapter, all gathered together. And, but some commentators are, uh, they disagree that eh, maybe it wasn't the, the upper room. And um, but there's a couple of reasons for that, that they, uh, that they say that. Um, I guess on the plus side, you could say, well, they were there earlier. And also you could consider, well, you know, there were probably safety concerns because they just killed Jesus, the powers that be. And so uh, maybe they needed to be a little more discreet in their meetings. Other people, other commentators, though, suggest that, well, maybe this meeting was actually in some area in or around the temple, which is kind of interesting thought. Um, and I think one of the arguments there is, well, there were so many people that heard this, that, that heard what was going on and ultimately got saved. Maybe there wasn't enough room in this upper room for them to hear that. Um, and... Um, and also, um, if I can, if you'll um, give me a little bit of grace to jump ahead for a moment, if you look in verse 46, if you have your Bibles there, after the, uh, this is almost the end of the chapter, it does say that uh, that the people who were saved along with the, the apostles, it says they continue daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. So clearly they were in the temple. Um, at some point. So those are all arguments for the other side of that. So um, uh, now is that a is that a heaven and hell issue, a salvation issue? Clearly not, but it's just something to kind of ponder about. So if you have thoughts on that, feel free to type those into the, uh, the chat window. Okay. All right. So uh, we see this, this great event happening in verse four, they spoke in tongues when the, 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 the spirit fell upon them. So then we go to the next, um, oops, there we go. So we go to the next set of uh, verses here. So starting with verse five and going through 13, we see the response of the crowd. And this was pretty interesting stuff here. So first of all, um, obviously this attracted a lot of attention. And verse five tells you that there were a lot of people in Jerusalem. Now, my version, which is New King James, it says, and there were dwelling in Jerusalem, um, various people. Now, um, I suspect, though, because this was the Pentecost feast that was going on, there's probably a mix of people that were um, actually residents of Jerusalem or nearby, and probably people from the uh, shall we say the diaspora, the Jews that have been scattered to various and sundry nations in town, in that, in the nation for this festival. So we probably had a mix of people, um, but obviously it attacked, it attracted a, a lot of attention because there was this loud sound of a rushing um, wind. And then there's all these people speaking in various tongues. And we see, if we, uh, we go forward a little bit, we see that the, the reaction of these people, they say in verse six, they were confused, this multitude, because people were hearing them speak in their own language. And, and of course, uh, they, they say in verse seven, well, wait, these people are Galileans. And I suspect that they could tell that they were Galileans because remember, we talked a couple of weeks ago about um, the, uh, this area where the, the this, around Jerusalem, Judea. Um, north of that was where Samaria was, and then north of that was where Galilee was. 
And so this was not homogenous. And I likened it to somebody coming from Texas, coming here to, to speak, and you'd say, well, you're obviously not from Pennsylvania. And so I think it was probably the same thing with the Galileans here. From their accent or their dialect, they knew that they were, um, they were Galileans. And so anyway, these people say, wow, um, we hear our own language um, being spoken here, the praises of God going forth. And then you get this long list of locations starting in verse 9. And I was able to dig up this cool map, which gives you an idea of where all those areas were that these people came from and were hearing their, their language. And of course, thinking about the technology of the time, some of these people came from a long ways away. And so um, they were all hearing their own language. Now, one thing I was wondering about, um, it says, uh, let's see. Uh, what verse was that? Well, it says uh, we're hearing our own language. And, um, and then, of course, it says, um, how is it that we hear in our own language in which we were born? So I'm curious. And again, this is not a heaven and hell thing. But do you think that the uh, that the apostles that were speaking in tongues, were they all speaking like the same language and the people just heard it in their own language? Or do you think they were actually speaking separate languages? Just a thought. Um, I, I, and I guess I say that because I'm like a Star Trek guy. And on Star Trek, they have the universal um, uh, translator thing. I don't know. It, it's it's not it, it's not a heaven and hell thing, but just uh, just one of those. Hmm, I I'm sure God is able to do that. Okay, uh, should I pause here, Sharon? I see there's a post that we have before we get too far away. Um, PJ says I always thought that the actual tongues of fire incident actually took place outdoors, possibly in the temple courtyard. Ah, there's some thought. It's an interesting issue, even though, uh, you know, my salvation doesn't depend on it. And there's some other things I'll mention later on that might also go along with that school of thought as well. Um, okay. So um, another interesting angle I saw for this whole thing of speaking in tongues and of uh, and being recognized as languages of other outlying areas is this. Uh, one of the commentators um, mentioned the whole idea of the Tower of Babel. So remember in the Tower of Babel, that whole story, um, God had to confuse the people because they were so united and so focused and purposed that they were going to accomplish what they wanted to. So he gave them different languages so that they couldn't understand each other, so that ultimately that failed and the language is scattered um, geographically, let's say. So here we kind of have the opposite of that. We see these languages, this use of various languages actually bringing people together and sort of uniting people uh, under this idea of the Spirit of God. And even though we speak different languages, we have the same God and they're all giving God praise. So interesting. Yes. We have another comment. Roger says, I believe that there were different languages being spoken. This is inclusivity. Is that how you say that, Roger? Inclusivity. <laughs> but, um, yes. That sounds like somebody who spent a lot of time in the academic environment. Uh -huh. <laughs> I think so. But uh, certainly God, <laughs> certainly God is inclusive, though. Uh, so. Um, I don't know. I, I mean, I don't. I don't think there's any uh, any uh, conclusive answer to that. But it's an interesting thought. Though. Thank you for that, Doc. The um, the last point I wanted to make here is just kind of a, on a personal note. Here, uh, you'll notice in verse. Uh, let's see if I put the verse. Yeah, verse eleven. Notice it says um, Cretans and Arabs. And so um, looking, researching that a little bit, it looks like the Arabs they were referring to were this group of people called the Nevadians. And Nevadians, they populated an area that would be basically modern day Jordan today. They controlled north-south trade routes there. 
And this uh, source said that the um, the capital city of this nation was Petra. And I was like, wow, Petra, I was there. So I had to throw this in. Uh, if you if you guys are, are familiar with Petra or if you're not, this is what it looks like. A city that was basically carved out of stone. And um, if you've ever seen, I think it was either the first or second Indiana Jones movie, they show him on a horse charging down this long canyon with these towering walls into the city of Petra. And I just thought it was pretty cool. It was like one of my bucket list things. And when I was in Jordan with Sharon about, I don't know how long ago that was, eight, six, seven years ago, something, we got to go to Petra. So this is one of the uh, the, the views of Petra, very cool place. So apparently that's where the Nevadians were, um, were headquartered. Okay. Um, yeah, definitely a bucket list item for me. It's just amazing. So uh, moving forward then, the next uh, set of verses here, starting with verse 14, um, these people that uh, that heard what was going on, they were just amazed by this and like, what's going on? We hear the praises of God. And on the other hand, there were a few haters there that said in verse 13, uh, they're probably just drunk. They're full of new wine. So in verse 14, Peter gives a response to that. So here we see the first time that Peter is publicly um, preaching Christ, essentially, after his, um, his restoration by Jesus. Because, of course, we all know Peter denied Jesus um, after he was arrested. Then Jesus restored Peter after he was resurrected. He restores Peter. That whole question thing about, Peter, do you love me? And he kept saying that, then feed my sheep. So here's Peter following through on that. Um, and the first thing he says is, um, in verse 15, he says, we're not drunk. These people aren't drunk because it's only the third hour of the day. And the third hour of the day should equate to 9 a.m. in the morning. And, of course, we know, like, 9 a.m., people are probably um, either still hung over from the night before or uh, they're not going to start drinking if they're drunk and drunks until a whole lot later in the day. So he's saying that, that um, um, they're, uh, they're certainly not drunk. And then he goes on to talk about, um, he cites some prophetic um, passages from the prophet Joel. Mark, um, yeah, before you go, go any further, Brian had a, a comment about the, the verses 5 through 11. Okay. He said, one thing we briefly talk about in Christianity 101 regarding verses 5 through 11 is how it was a new language since those individuals that were there received the Holy Spirit. But couldn't imagine being in, I don't know why yours isn't quite formatting on here, Brian. Let me make it bigger. Let's see. Now can you see it? But I couldn't imagine being in the, uh oh the space is that okay, my whole thing is messed up now oh you're halfway frozen maybe that's why okay he couldn't imagine being in the space where those who were from different areas of the world spoke another language that potentially they weren't even from nor visited that's pretty amazing i'm, I'm sure that um Assuming that it was they were actually speaking the language, um, <laughs> I, I could imagine my face as I said things that I didn't know I was capable of saying. That would be pretty amazing. Yeah, that would be. Pretty cool stuff. So, um, so Peter begins to address the crowd. He says, we're not drunk. It's only the third day. And then he, um, he cites the prophet Joel. And... Um, uh, specifically, here's the passage, Joel 2, 28 through 32. And you see that also, of course, in the second chapter of Acts here, uh, verses 17 through 21. And without reading the entire thing, um, notice in verse 17, though, it says, in, And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. 
So um, one of the things that I um, that I saw I thought was kind of interesting was the reference to last days. Um, a lot of the researchers believe that last days was actually defined as being from the day of Pentecost, where we are now, or in this passage, till Jesus comes back. Um, that's what they were referring to as the last days. And also the part about pouring out, um, God pouring out his spirit upon all flesh. Um, and remember that um, the prophetic word wasn't, um, wasn't all that common all the time through the, the centuries uh, preceding Jesus. And so rather than um, um, individual prophets receiving words from God, it says he's pouring out a spirit on all flesh. So it's kind of like the, the analogy of um, drops of water into a pond versus just pouring a, a big container or a, another stream pouring into this, this, uh, this lake. And so it's that kind of an idea that he's pouring out a spirit. And you'll notice that uh, he also says in verse 17, all flesh. There's no qualifier there. It's not saying I'm just going to pour out my spirit on the Jews, but everybody. Um, and of course, that's great news for us. So um, that's. There's, of course, some other imagery that that's uh, quoted here in the um in the passage from Joel, um, talking about wonders in heaven above, signs in the earth below. And some of that you might equate with the, the time of Jesus, perhaps, or you could also perhaps think of those as things that might happen in the future. The sun shall be turned into darkness, verse 20. Hmm. That's kind of interesting. I, didn't, didn't we just see that? Hmm. <laughs> just a thought. Um. I'm not sure about the blood moon. I guess we get enough of those, uh, those kind of red looking moons. But anyway, uh, the essential part of this is verse 21, where it says, and it shall come to pass, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Again, no qualification. You don't have to be a Jew. Anybody who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So then, um, Following um, Peter's sermon there, starting with verse 22, um, I call this uh, Peter listing Jesus's bona fides, essentially saying that, yeah, Jesus was the guy. He was the real deal. He was the Christ. He was the Messiah. So he begins to, um, to lay this out here in verses 22 and 23. Um, and he says that, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs. And of course, those were very public um, miracles and signs. So that's why he says God did, uh, Jesus did them in your midst. And then I, I think the next part of this is pretty interesting. In verse 23, he says, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, um, and just a sec oh there we go you have taken by lawless hands a crucified and put to death that's an interesting statement number one um he clearly says that this whole idea of jesus being uh crucified was part of god's plan this was the, the determined purpose and foreknowledge of god but then i wonder uh this sounds a little risky the second part he says where he talks about um, you have taken by lawless hands. So that almost sounds like something Jesus would have said when he was uh, going back and forth with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So to me, that's a, a little bit risky language, calling that lawless, especially uh, for some of the people that were present, especially like if we take the, uh, the, the tact that indeed maybe they weren't in the upper room, but if they were in or around the temple, I'm sure the powers that be either heard or heard about that very quickly. So that might've been a little risky to say there. And then um, the, the next verse 24, Peter talks about that, of course, um, Christ was loose. He loosed the pains of death. God raised him up. He loosed the pains of death because it was not possible to be held by death. So then, um, 
he, um, after saying that, he quotes uh, David. And of course, David is one of the big patriarchs of Israel that uh, everyone respects and um, and has, uh, well, just has enormous respect for. So in uh, starting with verse 25, he quotes David here. And uh, this would be uh, really two passages are coming up here. He, um, the first one verses, uh, was that 25 through um, 28? Um, he's quoting David there. And this is Psalms 16, 8 through 11. Psalms 16, 8 through 11. And um, so he, he quotes David, I force in uh, reading this. I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand that I might not be shaken. And then the important part is probably if you jump down to verse 27 in this passage, it says, for you will not leave my soul in Hades or hell, uh, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. So that's really the, the, the meaty part of this. And because Peter goes on to say after this, that when uh, in verse 29, he's saying that David, the patriarch, he wasn't talking about himself saying, you won't leave my soul in Hades or you won't allow me to have corruption because we know he's in the grave right now. So he clearly, this passage in Psalms is clearly not talking about um, David, but he's uh, uh, essentially David is uh, prophesying about Jesus here. And um, and you see a little bit more of that language in the next couple of, of uh, verses there. Um, verse 30 particularly says, Therefore, being a prophet, knowing God had sworn an oath with him, that the fruit of his body, the fruit of David's body, that is, um, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne, the throne of David. And, um, and then Peter goes on in verse uh, 32 and 33, to say that Jesus was raised up by God and he sits at the right hand of God and um, essentially being God's um, co-ruler, vizier, whatever you want to call it. And so uh, Peter continues to uh, to lay out this, this case. And then he also quotes, uh, the other Psalm is, um, I think that's 68, 18. The second part that's in verse 34 here, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Um, and that might that might ring a bell for some of us because that was a scripture that also Jesus quoted back in the book of Matthew when um, he was uh, contending with the, uh, the the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And he asked them a hard question. Well, how can David say this? Um, who was he talking about? And so uh, that's uh, that's something that Jesus said then. And, and here you see it quoted again. And so the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool, your enemies your footstool. So the conclusion of the matter, he wraps us up, Peter wraps us up in um, basically in verse 36, he says that, this guy that you crucified, this guy that you unlawfully killed, Jesus, he's both Lord and Christ. He's Christ the Messiah. He's the Christ that rose, and he's the Christ that now sits at the right hand of God uh, on the throne of David, um, if you want to think of it that way. So that's how he wraps his, his sermon up, pretty much. And then, um, and then of course, in... Um, I think in the next slide, we'll see a little bit about the crowd's reaction to that. So uh, should I pause here, Sharon? I saw some other activity scrolling there. Hmm. Let's see. Or did I? I don't. Oh, maybe not. Okay. Sorry. It's not on my screen. So. Uh, okay. Yeah, I think you're right. So, um, so continuing to verse 37, here we see um, the the reaction of the the crowd who was listening to Peter's sermon. In thirty seven, it says they were cut to the heart, and I just love the the way it's 
it's um, phrase there, cut to the heart, that the Holy Spirit brought conviction through um, the atmosphere and what Peter was saying. And it says that they were cut to the heart. They were convicted, if you want to put it that way. I think the um, the Strong's um, concordance says to prick or pierce, to pain the mind sharply, agitate it vehemently. And it also says, especially of the emotion of sorrow. So clearly the Holy Spirit worked in these people. And, um, and so they said in verse 37, men and brethren, what shall we do? <laughs> what do we need to do? And of course, uh, Peter was never uh, short on um, responses, so he was ready for that. And this is what Peter says in verse 38. He says, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remissions of sin, and you shall receive the Holy Ghost. So I consider those really the basics too: repent, repentance, baptism, and the Holy Spirit. Those are the basics of Christianity. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm sorry, was there a comment? Oh. That was me saying amen. Oh, okay. Well, amen. And I kind of emphasize that, emphasize that because uh, I know like when I first got saved back when I was like a, like a teenager, I used to think that people who were spirit filled were like these spiritual supermen. Like, wow, I could never do that. I could never get to that level. They're so deep and all that. When really that was just like a basic requirement. And I, you know, I was young, um, both in age and in experience. And so I didn't know that at the time. And later, of course, I, I found out. And, uh, but yeah, those are basic requirements. In verse 39, um, after Peter says that he gives the basic requirements, he says, this promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And I'm curious what how you guys interpret that, um, that little phrase, to all who are afar off. Does that mean like, um, I'm curious to get your thoughts. Is that like geographically? Is it um, far into the future? Um, is it far from God? Um, what do you think about that? So please feel free to uh, to type in some thoughts on that. Mark, could you restate that, please, in terms of what you want us to think about? Yeah, in verse 39, it says, The promise is to you and your children and to all who are afar off. So I'm... I'm not really sure how that is meant. Is it far from God? Is it far geographically, like spread around the known world? Um, is it far, like meaning future generations into the future? So give that a little thought, if you would. And um, we have a few comments already, Mark. Okay. Um, let me see if my screen is going to if it's going to agree with me and what let me do it okay malika says the amplified version says far off including gentiles ah. pj says could be both geographically as well as distant from god probably both that was my thought it was probably both and megan says generational and i like that mm -hmm. um let me see if i can scroll some more I think that was a lot. Oh, now oh, some and, and Theo says all of the above. Yeah, I guess that's kind of open to interpretation there. And uh, yeah, uh, I guess the the last thing I would say about that is um, um, in 38, uh, again, just backing up a little bit, he says, um, if you repent and be baptized, you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Notice, and I emphasize the word, it's a gift. It's not something you earn. Like when I thought when I was younger that you had to, you know, be all deep and know this, that, and the other to uh, to be able to attain that level till you could have the Holy Spirit. It's a gift. When folks give you something, it's just, it's yours. You don't earn it. You just receive it. 
Amen. Amen, Sister Stringer. Amen. So. Um, okay, we got another comment. Okay. And Malika says, but it says as many as the Lord our God calls to himself. Does that go back to the idea that God only called some, not all? And Kiana says amen to what we were saying as well. Does God call only some? Yeah. Does that go back to the idea that God only calls some, not all? Well, I guess my quick answer would be, I think God calls everybody. Now, how do you respond? Exactly. It's a different matter. Now, I I remember like years ago hearing this whole idea of this um, concept of what some people call election. Um, well, is everybody... Um, is everybody called? Is everybody elected? Or, or are there people that God is destined to uh, to eternal damnation? And I heard a really simple explanation. Somebody said it's like um, it's kind of like voting. God is voting for you. The devil is voting against you. And whichever way you choose, that's the way the election goes. I was like, I like that. Yeah. Cheryl says everyone whom the Lord calls to Himself. And I think one of my versions of the Bible says just that to everyone whom God calls to himself. I like that. Okay, so we come to the uh, the last section here, the last um, group of verses. And it says, uh, my, in my Bible, it's titled, Vital Church Grows. So uh, one of the things to note in verse 40, it says that, um, actually, uh, what we just went through was not the sum total of Peter's, um, sermon. It says there were other words he testified and exhorted them with, but they sum it up by saying, be saved from this perverse generation. So this was not a word by word, um, quote of everything that Peter said, just a summary, if you think of it that way. And, um, of course, the scripture tells us then in the next verse that, um, those who heard, uh, who gladly received the word were baptized and that day about 3000 souls were added to them. That's pretty crazy. And then in the, the next couple of verses, it talks about what they did, how they, uh, continued in the apostles doctrine and fellowship. They broke bread, they prayed together. And because of that whole unity and that, that oneness and togetherness, it says in verse, um, 43, fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles because of that. And I think it's because of that, that atmosphere was there. I'm kind of reminded of, remember, uh, at, at some point in the Gospels, it says that Jesus was able to do very few miracles in a certain area because of unbelief, that atmosphere of unbelief. Now, here we see the opposite of that. I mean, this is can you imagine the excitement of that early church and you're seeing signs and wonders and and you're hanging out and, and you're fellowshipping and you can just imagine the atmosphere that would be present for that. So I could see how those miracles, signs and wonders could happen there. And then it's really interesting also, it says that, um, well, I already did that one, but it also says that they had all things in common um, in verse 44, all things in common. And, and it specifies they sold their possessions and goods, divided them among all as anyone had need. Wow. You talk about like next level, hardcore Christianity. Can you imagine that? Like, uh, you know, Doc, I, um, I have a need. Do you think you could sell your car? I, I you know. <laughs> Yeah, that's like next level kind of stuff there. But nobody went wanting. So that's just amazing. That's what I call really hardcore stuff going on there. And also, uh, it also mentions this. They met daily. They um, It says that a couple of times, actually. Uh, so they met daily, um, including having meals together. And I think we all know how, how what a, a, a source of bonding that can be. Just hanging out eating together, talking about, you know, God things, or just other things. So it says they they had meals together. It mentions that two places, actually, in verse 42 
and also in 46. Now, it doesn't specifically say that they um, that they partook of the Lord's Supper, but I imagine that was part of it, though, because uh, remember Jesus said, do this um, in remembrance of me um, as often as you, know, you think of me, that kind of thing. I'm paraphrasing, but that's what Jesus said. So I, I imagine some of that was the Lord's Supper, but other ones were probably just casual meals there. Also, and Malika. Yes, Malika ma added that fellowship was significant. Mm -hmm. Yep, definitely. And, and I think we see that for ourselves. Fellowship is certainly significant. It is. Um, also, one of the commentaries mentioned that the idea of meeting daily, like it talks about in verse 46, says they continue daily with one accord. And, and then here's where it says the temple again, in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. So that was really an unusual thing for the time to, if there were groups that were meeting, they generally didn't meet every day like that. But as a result of that, we see the uh, thing summed up in the very last verse of the chapter 47. Uh, it says, praising God, having favor with all the people. And it says the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. I did want to point out um, the word church that appears here. Uh, when I, uh, one of the commentaries mentioned this, um, in the um, in the Greek, the word for church here is ecclesia, and that should sound kind of familiar, like as in Ecclesiastes, that kind of thing, um, a gathering of people, an assembly of people, um, and of course, for the purpose uh, here of, of um, worship, and it specifically says in a Christian sense, an assembly of Christians gathered together. So we get that, but also uh, one of the commentaries mentioned um, the Aramaic from which the, the Greek was translated, I believe. It says that the Aramaic word for church is the joining of two words, meet and come. In other words, that's like an invitation to enter into fellowship with Christ and his people. And I really like that uh, that idea that uh, it's uh, those two words together, meeting, uh, fellowshipping with Christ and his people. Pretty cool stuff. I think this chapter probably introduces two new words to the fellowship as to church and apostle, because those words hadn't been used before, had they? There, I think there was one other place where the word church came up and I'm thinking of um, when uh, Jesus refers to Peter or Cephas he says upon oh, yeah. the rock I'll build my church yeah because I had the same thought and I was like let me go back and do a little search and and I so I think that might have been the only other place and PJ if you know another one um, let us know but certainly a new concept though and this is, if, if you think about that, this is really, again, the fulfillment of what Jesus said to Peter, upon this rock, I'm going to build my church. Pretty cool stuff. Ah, another quote from Doc. Oinonia. Oinonia, Christian fellowship or communion with God or more commonly with fellow Christians. That's good. That's good stuff. Ooh. Throwing a little Greek at us, huh? <laughs> okay, so um, no, I did throw this bullet point in there. I forgot to click on it. Okay, so that's the end of our chapter. Now, I do have a couple of things. Uh, let's take a, see if we can take a few minutes and answer um, one and or two of these questions. See what you think about these. Um, <clears throat> And backing up to verse 41, um, it says, then those who gladly received that word from Peter were baptized. And it says that that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. So I'm curious um, what you think about that. Were there 3,000 people that were all baptized that day? Or did this occur, do you think maybe it occurred over a, a longer period of time? And if they were baptized that day, 
like where did they baptize those folks? Um, some thoughts there. Um, now there were, just to give you a little bit of info, there were some facilities at the temple themselves. There were a series of ritual pools for ritual cleansing. Um, so if you subscribe to the idea that maybe this whole event happened at the, um, the temple, maybe that's a viable solution. I don't know. But anyway, think about that. And then the second question is, is this, which is probably more of a head, um, head scratcher or maybe a chin scratcher. Um, remember I said this earlier that in John 20, 22, Jesus breathed on his disciples and he says, receive the spirit. And here we see, of course, in, in this chapter that we're studying, the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So um, is there a difference between these two? Or um, what do you think about these two references to the Spirit? So ponder that and, and also type something and see what you think. We'll give you a few minutes to do that before we wrap up. We have one answer here, Brother Stringer. BJ says they probably moved the celebration down to the river or seashore that day or night. And Theo says PJ preached about this before. This was a huge market or trading place for all kinds of people. So there were probably more than 3,000 people around this event. Well, yeah, that's certainly true. There's got to be more than 3,000 because it says there were only 3,000 that were that were saved. So there were probably a lot of folks who who weren't convinced and but were present. Yeah, you're certainly right there. Down to the river, huh? And make sure somebody... Um, says something about question two, if you will. That's a that's a tough one. And Theo breaks into song. Down by the riverside. And Malika says in John, Jesus breathed on them and they were to receive the Holy Spirit. In Acts, the people were filled and there was a physical manifestation of the filling of the Holy Spirit. Ah, that's and, great insight. That is great insight. But my question is, was about the the apostles that he breathed on, his disciples. Is it the same or is this something, speaking of something different? And Alyssa says she was thinking it was the same thing. I think we missed one up above there. I think Roger had a um, comment about question two. Oh, my thing skipped all the way down. Brenda had something too. Um, Roger says, question two, I believe the difference is intent. When God released the Holy Spirit, it was one intent. And when the disciples released the Holy Spirit, it was different. Brenda says, I feel like it happened the same day, but I have no clue how they would have done that. God is 
magnificent. So I have no doubt he would figure it out. And but, that's referring to the baptism, I assume, the, the physical water baptism. I'm assuming that's what Brenda was meaning. And PJ says, second uh, question two, John 20 was the spoken word, which should have been accepted by faith. Acts 2 was the full manifestation of that word, faith becoming sight. Theo's down by the riverside. Malika says, in John, Jesus breathed on them and they were to receive the Holy Spirit. In Acts, the people were filled, and there was a physical manifestation of the filling of the Holy Spirit. That's basically what PJ was saying. Uh -huh. And Alyssa says she thinks it was the same thing. PJ says, oh, this is the same one. It was the spoken word, which should have been accepted by faith. And Acts 2 was the full manifestation of the word, faith becoming sight. Megan said, one Jesus was still on earth, and in Acts, Jesus had already ascended. Very Perfect. good insight. Everybody heard. Good stuff. All right. So hopefully you had your spiritual thinking caps on a bit for that. Some good input and feedback. Um, let's see. Uh, one more thing we need to do before we uh, get out of here. Um, we, uh, now remember, of course, previous to jumping into Acts, we looked at the gospel of Matthew. However, of course, there's, there's a couple of other, um, versions of the gospels that we didn't cover. And there's some, um, some information overlaps, other information doesn't. So I wanted to make a couple of, uh, references available for you guys. So if you go to our, uh, one of the places, if you go to our website now, uh, myvictory.org, there's a new tab and it'll look like this Bible study. And um, it's a little advertisement for the Bible study itself, but there's also two links under extra resources. Now um, I'll also, I'll, I'll paste these into the chat window. If you want to take a quick look at them tonight, um, but they help compare those various versions of the, uh, of the gospels. And I got a little screenshot here. Here's what the one looks like. And it's really helpful because it lays out all the various events that happened in the Gospels, and then it has a table for each uh, book, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and what verses that occurred in. So you can line those up pretty easily, and it goes through every single um, uh, event as far as I can tell. So that's a pretty good um, aid. And then secondly, there's uh, this, the, this other one, which is a summary of each book, and it gives you some detailed information uh, Matthew, who was the, the author of Matthew, when it occurred, genealogy, did that occur, um, a little bit about the emphasis of the book and that sort of thing. So really a couple of ways that you have to approach that. So now, if you will, I will um, let me grab those links for you guys and I will put them in here. Let me stop sharing. That would probably make my life a little easier. There we go. And uh, let's see. Okay, here's the one. And uh, paste. Okay, so there's the one in the chat window. And here's the other one. Oddly enough, it shows up in this website that's uh, set, that's called Native American Marriage Enhancement, which is a little bit uh, of an unlikely source, but uh, that's where the other one is. So you have those in the chat window. And again, like I said, if you just go to our website uh, under the Bible study tab on the left, uh, you can get to those as well. So, uh, there you have it. I think we are done, and we've managed to um, just make our one-hour time limit. How about that? Thank you, Brother Stringer. That was very good. Thank you, Sister Stringer. So let's wrap up with a quick word of prayer. 
Um, also, I guess we'll be doing who's who's up next week, and what are they doing? Chapter three, I assume. Mm -hmm. Aha, there we go. Oh yeah, breakfast with Jesus this Sunday. Woo Don't forget about <laughs> breakfast with Jesus. Yeah, I'll, I'll be there with the Lord. <laughs> We will be there. So, Father God, we thank you for this time of study and fellowship and learning your word and learning about your spirit coming down and just that uh, the, the veil has been rent and we have direct access to you, God, and we are just eternally grateful for that, God. Thank you for everyone who came out tonight, and we just thank you for just increasing their knowledge of the word and drawing them closer to you through it, Lord. Yes, we thank you for just continuing to do what you're doing here, Lord. We thank you for a great time. And we just pray that you keep every one of us until we meet again at the appointed time, which is breakfast with Jesus on Sunday, I think. Yeah. 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 In the name of Jesus. Amen. Yeah. We're cooking with oil. Yeah. I'll see y'all. Great job, Mark, Darren. Great job. I learned a lot. All right. job has been accomplished. The people are leaving. Are they supposed to? I guess so. I'll come back. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'll see y'all. Good night. Bye. Where's my window? There it is. Okay. Bye. 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 <laughs>